welcome all tonight. I'm Joe Del Santo, Professor of Astronomy here at the College of DuPage. And it's a very, uh, pl real pleasure to have you with us tonight for our discussion on the Milky Way. I see a lot of familiar faces and some new ones. So again, real nice having you all with. Try to develop a presentation I think you're going to enjoy. Real mind boggling topic tonight for us to consider the Milky Way galaxy. Usually we go about an hour or so, and then after that we can take some questions for whoever would like to remain. So sit back and enjoy the ride as we explore our Milky Way. You can see here a view of the Milky Way galaxy, taken uh, over the course of several nights. Wide angle cameras kind of stitched this together. This is a view that's very difficult to get from most places on Earth. How many of you have maybe seen the Milky Way from somewhere dark? Oh, that's nice. It's not so often that we get to see that with our modern civilization and lights, but if you ever have the opportunity to be somewhere dark, it's quite an amazing sight. You notice the Milky Way here looks somewhat irregular in its appearance. We see some bright regions, but some darker regions, so we're going to discuss exactly what those signify. But as usual, I always like to start out with just a bit of history to take us back and kind of trace the development of our understanding of the Milky Way galaxy. So one of my favorite astronomers, I'm sure you've probably heard the name before, William Herschel. Really one of the first to take a serious look at the Milky Way. And recently I uh, f completed a reading a biography of uh, Herschel. Just astonishing what he was able to accomplish uh, with his very limited uh, technology. Very brilliant man. He, he carried on some impressive studies. So he decided he was going to try to understand the Milky Way galaxy. And again, with his limited technology, he did pretty much the only thing he could do. He started counting stars in different areas. And he thought, well, if I go ahead and count these and compare them, I should get an idea roughly where more of the stars are or less. And assuming that the stars were at least relatively equal in brightness, that would give me some indication of the structure of the Milky Way. So he's a very, very patient, very uh, hardworking observer, as you can see here, over a number of years. He tediously and painstakingly mapped the Milky Way. And you can see in the bottom left here his model, what he came up with. Kind of an irregular shape, about 6,400 light years in extent, maybe 1,300 light years in height, and thought it was somewhat disshaped. And it certainly appeared that we were roughly in the middle of the Milky Way. And thus, that diagram we saw initially, the Milky Way would essentially wrap around us. Now, of course, we, we can't really see the entire Milky Way standing on our Earth with the planet blocking some of that. But if we were able to, it would basically circle the sky around us, and we'd get this dramatic view of being inside this disk-shaped system. Well, that's where things stood, really, through much of the 19th century, because, again, we really didn't have the technology to pursue this study much farther. But by the early 20th century, one other astronomer, Kapteen here, he also took a look at the Milky Way and did something similar, a bit more sophisticated. He basically came up with a very similar idea, except that the Milky Way to him was much larger. As you can see my, my figure here, 50,000 light years in diameter. Probably many of you are familiar with that unit. A light year is the distance light will travel in a year. It's about 6 trillion miles. So if you take 6 trillion times 50,000, you know the Milky Way is quite large. So as the 20th century began, that was our general idea of the Milky Way. There was quite a bit of discussion as to whether it was the entire universe or if there could be something beyond it. We simply didn't know yet. But as with really all of science, knowledge progresses. We began to learn more as we went on. By the 1920s, an astronomer named Harlow Shapley decided to go out and try to determine better the extent of the Milky Way. If you look closely at my diagram here in the upper left, this is a close-up view of what we call a globular star cluster. And we're going to come back to those a little bit later. But if you look closely, I think you'll see some of the stars appearing to kind of get brighter and dimmer. And Shapley and others had discovered that these stars changed their brightness in a regular pattern that indicated how much light they were giving out or their luminosity. And if he was to take their luminosity, knowing how much light they gave off, and compare it to their brightness, he could determine the distance of a globular star cluster. And these turned out to be some tens of thousands of light years away 
But interestingly, what Shapley found, as you see in my diagram here, is that the globular clusters were not uniformly distributed around us. We seem to be kind of on the outside looking in, so to speak. It's almost as if I was the Earth and you were all globular star clusters. I would not certainly be in the middle, but if I was to carefully measure the distance to all of you and determine where the center was, I would know how far away from the center I was. And that's exactly what Shapley was able to do. He then correctly made the conclusion that, well, certainly the center of all of these star clusters was the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So this was our first and very solid evidence that we were not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, even though it appeared as if we were. So this was a significant step forward for Shapley to be able to tell us that we were not at the center. And as you can see, according to the diagram here, the Milky Way was even larger than we thought, approximately 100,000 light years in diameter. So this was a big step forward to get a much better estimation of the size and begin to understand the shape of the Milky Way here in the early 20th century. So about this time, we began to put together a little better model of the Milky Way. You can see, as we're looking at the Milky Way here on edge, we see this round central bulge region, somewhat spherical, a little bit flattened, and a long, thin, flattened disk. Notice the sun is in that disk. And notice we are, again, a considerable distance from the center, approximately 28,000 light years away. Notice the extent, again, 100,000 light years. Notice the globular star clusters orbiting around the center controlled by the Milky Way's gravity. And I'll point out too, somewhat difficult to see, but a very faint halo component, much larger spherical component surrounding the entire galaxy, but a relatively low number of stars, relatively low density of stars. But this will be significant for us a little bit later as we'll see. So again, by the early 20th century, we began to improve our understanding, our model of the Milky Way galaxy. This would be an edge-on view. If we were to somehow possibly be able to fly up out of the Milky Way, we can't, and look back, we might see something a little more like this. Now, uh, you might recognize this is actually a picture of a, a nearby galaxy called the Andromeda galaxy, but it's pretty similar to ours. You see this beautiful disk shape here. You see that large central bulge region. You see that beautiful disk. And you notice some regions of darker dust outlining spiral arms. I want to point out something else that's very significant here that we're going to be talking about throughout the discussion. If you notice, there's a subtle color difference between the stars in that central bulge. They tend to be more yellowish compared to the stars in the disk, which tend to be more bluish. Now, astronomers could tell you that those colors are giving us a very rough indication of temperature. In other words, the yellow stars there in the center are somewhat lower temperature. And later on, I'll touch on the fact that this indicates they're somewhat lower mass stars. In contrast, notice in the disk, the stars appear somewhat bluer. And this indicates a higher temperature star, also indicating a higher mass star. So these are very subtle observations, but they're significant because they do actually start to tell us just a little bit about the different types of stars that are there. And we'll be coming back in more detail to discuss this later. But I think this is a nice picture for us to be able to see the difference there, these two distinct populations of stars. Okay. So how massive is the Milky Way? In other words, how much stuff is there? There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. We have a technique that we can use to determine the mass of something like the Milky Way if we carefully measure the orbit of an object around its center. <coughs> this can be used in many ways. It could be used here in our solar system. This could be used in other places. But even at this vast scale, if we're able to determine the motion of the sun as it orbits around the Milky Way, we can use that to help us find the mass. Some of you may have heard of Kepler's laws of motion. This is where this comes in. And Isaac Newton took that one step further and extended it to something called Newton's version of Kepler's third law. Some of my students are familiar with that. 
And so the point is this, when we measure the sun's orbit, we find this astonishing number, 230 million years for the sun to orbit the Milky Way. Is that enormous? I mean, it's just mind-boggling to think how long of a period of time that is, and yet we have a pretty reliable estimate of that motion. So we take that, we combine it with the distance. These are the two key measurements we need, the distance and the period, and we can use that to calculate the mass, and we come up with, again, an astonishing number, approximately 200 billion times that of the sun. So picture the sun as being one unit of stellar mass. If all the stars were equivalent, there would be 200 billion stars. Now they're not. We'll come back again later and see that there are some much more massive, some much lower mass. But if they were all equivalent, imagine 200 billion stars here in the Milky Way. I want to just also mention that that number is the mass within or inside uh, the sun's orbit. It does not allow us to calculate the mass outside of it. Now, at this point, you're thinking, well, that sure looks like it's encompassing most of it, right? Keep that thought in mind. We're going to come back to that and re-examine that presently. Just recently, some studies further refined our measurements, and they confirmed basically that number within the sun's orbit of about 200 billion solar masses. So the Milky Way is quite a massive galaxy. We're going to see some others later that are not so massive. There are a few that are more massive but it's a very large size galaxy as they go. Other recent studies have shown us a bit more detail as you see here on the Milky Way's structure. It turns out that that central region is not quite so spherical. Instead, it's more of a longer extended bar shape. And we'll see later on this is not uncommon. For some time we thought the Milky Way's central region was spherical, but again, we see now better research indicating that it is this bar shape. And frankly, this is very difficult for astronomers to explain this structure. It's extremely large, approximately 30,000 light years in length. And as the Milky Way is rotating, you would expect it to gradually shear out and become more spherical, but it doesn't. Evidently, a very long-lived structure. So Milky Way is quite a complex structure for us to try to understand at these scales, thousands of light years in size. You see here, too, a much clearer view of the Milky Way's spiral arms. Two main spiral arms our galaxy has, the Scutum Centaurus arm and the Perseus arm. Note that our sun is basically between the two major arms. It's in the region here we call the Orion Spur. So we have a relatively clear view of some of the neighboring regions, but as we'll talk about, there's areas we might look a certain direction and some of the dust is blocking our view. We don't see it very clearly there. Other directions we might see a little bit farther, but we simply cannot see the entire Milky Way clearly from our perspective because we're within it and there's so much in it. Again, dust especially blocks our view in visible light. So gradually, slowly through the 20th century, we've continued to improve our understanding of the Milky Way. We've mapped it in better extent. As we'll see, we've got different techniques to be able to do that. I want to go back now for a minute and uh, revisit that topic I started with the various stars. Again, a wide variety of sizes, masses, temperatures, even ages, but two major populations. Very simply, population one stars, these tend to orbit in that flat disk or that flat plane of the Milky Way. Their orbits are relatively circular, and they're, we might call, fairly well-behaved stars. Okay? We will find out that, again, in that disk, we saw they are somewhat, on average, more massive, hotter, and as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, younger stars. Significantly, they also have less of what astronomers call heavy elements, and that's basically any element heavier than helium. But that's a significant point we'll explore as well as we go along. In contrast, these population two stars inhabit the central bulge region, and that much larger halo region. These stars, on average, tend to be lower mass, lower temperature, older stars. So right away when we think about that, we think, well, if they're older, clearly they would have appeared earlier in the history of the Milky Way. And while we won't take a lot of time to go back there, picture an early Milky Way primarily inhabited by those stars, whereas later, more in our time period, that disk forms newer stars 
such as our Sun. Our Sun is a population one disk star. So again, we continue to add to our understanding. We see a little bit more detail here. We add pieces and the complexity of the Milky Way grows as we continue to learn about it. Let's take a few minutes though and talk about star formation. You see a beautiful image here. Maybe you recognize this, the Orion Nebula. Maybe we've seen pictures of that, the beautiful colors here. What's going on? Well, this nebula is essentially a giant cloud of gas out in space. Here's where stars are forming. How do we know that? Well, number one, we can see some young stars there in the center where it's very bright. We've looked in there and examined them. We have ways to get a pretty good idea of their age. But essentially, there are stars that we can see in the various stages of formation. It's a little bit like people. If we took a snapshot tonight of a larger crowd, we might see people of all different ages. We wouldn't see any one person age in one night. But if we looked at people of all different ages, we could probably put together, couldn't we, the life cycle of a human? They start out as infants, small children, adolescents, young adults, and then move on to older ages. So same thing is happening here. And when these first stars form, they give off tremendous amount of light, tremendous amount of energy. And that energy causes the gas to light up, to glow, essentially. Essentially what's happening is the gas absorbs the energetic ultraviolet light from stars, and then it re-emits it as visible wavelengths of light that you and I can take a picture of, these beautiful reds and blues here. So this is a clear indication that star formation is occurring here. How does that happen? Well, very briefly, it's gravity. Gravity does the work. It takes time. Gravity works slowly. But picture this cloud of particles, all these little particles pulling on each other gradually. Some areas will be denser than others. And here you'll have a little more gravity to gradually compress this gas. I'm greatly simplifying. It's not quite that simple. But I think you get the general idea. And eventually, these regions of higher density will get so dense and so hot and such strong gravity that in this very center, they'll get hot enough for the stars to essentially light up. Okay? And they will then generate energy using nuclear fusion in their centers. Our sun generates energy via nuclear fusion. I hinted a little bit earlier on the fact that more massive stars tend to be hotter. They have stronger gravity. And to balance that gravity, they must produce more energy to be stable. And so as a result, what happens is they have to burn their fuel faster. And as a result, the fuel doesn't last as long. So they don't live as long of a life as a lower mass star that can use its fuel more slowly. So we get stars of all different masses forming in the uh, nebula here. Some form more quickly, some a little slower. Some are going to live longer, some are going to live a shorter time. But we get a tremendous variety here within this region. I'm going to take just a minute now and describe from the perspective of the Milky Way what we call the stellar life cycle. At the top, you can see some brightly colored pictures. These are what we call false color images. And the reason we're doing this later on, I'll explain that we're looking at different wavelengths of light here. But what we're seeing at the top is warm gas out in space. Now when the gas is warm, the particles are moving fairly quickly. They can't really allow gravity to have them form stars. But as we move over towards the upper right, the gas begins to cool. And here's where gravity can begin to bring the gas together because the particles simply are not moving as fast. So again, slowly, gradually, we move down to the lower right. Maybe you've seen that picture before. We get regions of higher density. And those regions of higher density, again, are where stars are going to form. I mentioned that stars, once they do form, they ignite in their center. They generate energy by nuclear fusion. And basically, they are changing hydrogen into helium for most of their life. At the end of that time, they're going to run out of helium. They're going to go through some changes, which I won't go into great detail. But that's where they will then often create even heavier elements. Helium will fuse into the next heavier elements, such as carbon and oxygen and so forth. And we'll see later on the consequences of the stars doing that. As we move over to the left, you notice a couple of circular features there. These are images taken of stars that have used up their fuel. They have run out of fuel to balance gravity. And they're going to go through some dramatic changes 
and most stars are going to expel their matter back out into space. Now some of them do it fairly gently, others much more violently. The circular object you see there up to the upper left is an X-ray image of a supernova explosion where a star has, again, violently exploded, and basically it's going to spew its matter back out into space, and you can see the cycle is going to start over because that matter floating among the stars is going to slowly cool, gravity is going to start to work on it, and it can form the next generation of stars. And here's the key. Clearly those stars made some heavy elements I just said. The next generation of stars will have a slightly higher amount of those heavier elements. So generation after generation after generation of stars will slowly, gradually increase the amount of those heavy elements that those stars have. So this is the life cycle of stars in the Milky Way. Stepping back at a large scale here, of course, looking at it, but it does give you a grand view of the processes occurring over millions of years. Ultimately, of course, when you think about a star, our sun is a third generation star. It has a moderate amount of heavier elements, and when that star formed, there were enough of those heavy elements surrounding it to form planets. So what a fascinating story. We get our first glimpse, there's so much still to learn, but we get our first glimpse of how not only stars form, but even how they're accompanied by planets. So speaking of stars, just want to impress on you the sizes here. You can get some idea, I hope. You see this enormous supergiant star, 300 million miles in diameter. Some of these can exceed the orbit of Mars if they were placed where our sun is. Can you imagine that? Earth would be inside that star. That is an enormous star. That's why we call it a supergiant. We see also some giant stars there. They're pretty large as well. They can sometimes be almost as large as Earth's orbit. Then you see our sun there in the small box. And if we zoom in and look at our sun, enlarged on the lower right, we notice that it, clearly it's far larger than Earth, but there are stars as small as the Earth, called white dwarf stars. And yes, there's even one smaller than that. You can just barely see a neutron star only 20 miles across. So what a tremendous range of sizes of stars. When we use that term, they are by no means equivalent, are they? So that's another whole fascinating topic to go off and talk about. I'll have to come back to that in another lecture. Let's go back for just a minute on the, the nebulae here. Again, we saw that Orion Nebula is a formation site for stars, gas, and dust. Notice in the lower center, though, we see kind of a dark cloud. Well, here's a cloud that is still fairly cold. The stars are not really forming it within it, but it's very dense and dark. We simply call that a dark nebula. It could in the future, perhaps, uh, be able to produce stars, but it's not currently. In the lower right, I want to highlight a very special type of nebula called a planetary nebula. Now, this is a very different object, even though we use a similar term here. You see it appears somewhat circular. This is an object that results at the end of a star's life, not at its birth. I touched on this just briefly, that as the stars go through changes, at the end of their lives, they're going to expel matter out into space. So here's an example where it's not quite so violent. This would be a lower mass star. And as that lower mass star expels its mass, most of its mass, at least out into space, the very small hot central core is still left over, and that very small hot central core is giving off some very powerful energy, some very high energy ultraviolet light, and that ultraviolet light now will basically light up this smaller circular planetary nebula. It's actually a very poor name for it. It has nothing to do with planets, but early observers, when they first saw these, said, oh, they're round, they look like a planet. So the name kind of stuck. So this is, again, another whole uh, study to itself that we can go off and learn about these. This is the famous ring nebula. There's hundreds of them in the Milky Way that allow us to learn more about the end state of stars, how they've changed, how different they are. Some have different shapes and sizes and compositions and temperatures. Again, a tremendous variety there of these uh, objects throughout the Milky Way. Well, let's step back now and look at star clusters. Here we see a beautiful example of the open star cluster M11. So it turns out when stars form in the Milky Way, as I described, they don't form alone. 
those clouds that I mentioned are going to have thousands of solar masses of material. And as a result, thousands of stars often can form in one large region. And often what happens is many of them as they form are being gravitationally held together in what we call a star cluster. These open star clusters tend to inhabit the disk, the spiral arms of our galaxy. That's where the star formation is occurring. And what's interesting is we have now a great opportunity to study these stars in comparison to each other as a group, as it were, instead of just studying them individually. Once again, I mentioned that the high mass stars are going to consume their fuel faster and they're going to change more quickly. And one of the ways that they're primarily going to change is they're going to, ex again, expel that matter. But before they do that, they will swell into these giant and supergiant stars. So we can watch for that. And astronomers have been able to go in and, using the laws of physics, model how long that will take. For example, if we start out with a star like the Sun, we can determine that it will last approximately 10 billion years burning its hydrogen into helium. It's a long time. But if we have a more massive star, perhaps 10 times the mass of the sun, it's only going to live a much shorter time. I'll just pick a round number here, 100 million years before it swells into a giant star. So the point is this, when we look at a star cluster, we know that the stars pretty much formed at the same time. Maybe some took a little longer than others, but all the stars are approximately the same age here. And if we go ahead and look closely, Look at the diagram here. Maybe you can pick out somewhere a few of the redder stars. Do you notice a couple there? Lower right. Yeah, I notice one right here. If you can see my mouse, I don't know. There's one down here on the lower left. These are stars that have swelled into giant size. It's a separate stage of their life, red giant star. So the point is we can look at those, measure their properties, and say, ah, that star has this much mass. Clearly, it's a red giant. It took this long, therefore the star formed this long ago. And as a result, we can tell you the age of the star cluster. In this case, as you can see there, about 250 million years ago. So it's a fascinating field to be able to do that, to look at the star clusters, compare their stars, see which ones are changing yet or which ones are not changing yet, and get a pretty good feel for their ages and watch them as they change over time these open star clusters. Some are very, very young, and by that, astronomers mean a few million years old. But others may be hundreds of millions or thousands of millions of years old. So that's rather humbling, isn't it? To think about these stars that have been out there for all of that time, and yet here we are able to study them and learn so much more about them. We mentioned the globular star clusters. We get a little better view of one here, a spectacular image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of the cluster M80. I mentioned that these now are outside of the Milky Way orbiting. Remember Harlow Shapley mapped their locations, and using that he's able to tell us the extent of the Milky Way, but these star clusters are again yet another fascinating story to themselves. Notice closely how many more red stars we have here. In fact, it almost appears as most of them are reddish and yellowish, aren't they? So based on what we said earlier, wouldn't that indicate older age? Yeah, these are those population two stars. There's very little gas and dust left in these objects to make any new stars, so these are the older stars left over in the globular star clusters. Some of these we think can be quite old, perhaps almost as old as the Milky Way itself perhaps 10 billion years old. So again, mind-boggling to consider these amazing structures, these majestic clusters, hundreds of thousands of stars held together by gravity, orbiting around the Milky Way. Makes us feel very small to be able to study these types of things and learn what a magnificent uh, system that we really do live in. So, we've really discussed a lot, haven't we? Let's step back, kind of put the pieces back together one more time. Again, we, we saw that central bulge. We saw that flattened disk. We saw, of course, the sun is off to distance from the center there. We notice our globular star clusters outside the Milky Way. We notice our open star clusters within it. And notice again that outer halo. 
that outer halo, a very lower density, so to speak, of stars, not so many there. But being older stars tells us that that would have been the earliest part of the galaxy to form before the disk. So while we don't have time to go into great detail on the formation of the Milky Way, picture the early Milky Ways being somewhat spherical. Early stars formed in that essentially shape. Later, many of the stars and other mass would then gradually form that disk that we see today. But we might think of this almost like a fossil remnant of the early Milky Way. So up till now, we've, I think, done a nice job of describing the basic structure and components of the Milky Way, some various factors involved, but there's so much more to talk about. And up till now, we've really focused on what we normally see in everyday visible light. But I want to take a few minutes now and take us on a bit of a journey and see how astronomers can use other forms of light to really explore and understand the Milky Way in much greater detail. I like to think of it as, again, if you meet a new person and you might think of them as a certain role in life, whether it's a friend or a teacher or a brother, most people have many aspects to their personality, don't they? Many roles, perhaps? And that's exactly what we're going to see now with the Milky Way. We're going to take a look at it in different wavelengths of light. Now, some of these pictures on the right look a little bit garish. We see some bright colors here. Astronomers do this to be able to see the maximum amount of information. Starting at the top, we're really looking at a very large image of the Milky Way, as we saw at the outset, shrunk way down. Really, the disk of the Milky Way is apparent, especially here at the top. We're going to start out at very long wavelengths of radio waves. And here, we're going to work our way down to shorter and shorter wavelengths as we go along. And I'll just mention a few interesting facts regarding that. So radio waves are very low energy form of light. This indicates relatively low energy material or cooler material out there in space. Think of gas and dust at a very low temperature. We can kind of see that there. As we start to move down, see our images begin to change. We still see this flattened disk, so to speak. Now we're moving into a little bit more of the infrared wavelengths, microwave wave wavelengths and so forth. Here, the material is a little bit warmer, a little bit more energetic, giving off a little bit different type of light that we can observe and learn about. As we continue down through the infrared here in the middle stages, we eventually get down all the way down to visible light that we saw at the outside. I know it's a kind of a smaller image here, but here in visible light, notice these dark regions. I touched on this briefly that here's where dust is blocking our view in visible light. We can't see through dust invisible light. The wavelengths are of a certain size that the dust simply blocks them. So I'll go back up just briefly, again back up into the infrared here, and here we can see through the dust at those wavelengths. So do you see the advantage there? If we want to study the distant parts of the Milky Way, we can't see them in visible light. We've got to turn to infrared light to look through the dust to be able to see farther. And we're going to see an example of that here in just a few minutes. As we finish up at the bottom, we now have some even higher energy wavelength views, such as ultraviolet, even X-ray, and even gamma ray energies. Extremely violent, extremely energetic type of light that is telling us something else about the Milky Way here as well. So that gives us a nice understanding that surely we could go off in these various wavelengths, and many astronomers do that. They'll specialize in a certain particular view of the Milky Way, and they'll learn so much about this and this and this. Don't have time to go into that now. But I do want to take one example and show you the power of this technique. And that is using infrared light, as I said, to look through the dust. Because frankly, wouldn't it be kind of interesting to know what's at the center? For a long time, scientists wondered. What's at the center of the Milky Way? Now again, we can't see it in visible light, but we can if we use infrared light. So here's some early views. When we first start to take some images, we see some stars, obviously. We see kind of a brighter region there. Looks kind of interesting. We might decide to zoom in, so we're going to do that as we go along. We can use not only infrared, but again, microwave and even radio wavelengths to kind of look through that material. And this uh, technique has been successfully used to look even closer into the center. We see some structures here as we move over to the right hand picture. We now move into kind of false color. It's not what it would really look like, but it's essentially a map of intensity of the light in the various colors here. Well, it looks kind of interesting, almost like a bit of a spiral. Now I want to 
clarify, this has nothing to do with the huge spiral arms that we've seen pictures of. This is far smaller. But sooner or later, it looks like something interesting is happening there, doesn't it? And so scientists were naturally curious. Well, what they did about 10 or 15 years ago was deploy a new technique to give us the very sharpest, crispest view possible of that central region to see what we could find. And here's what we found. And no, there's not really arrows there pointing the way for us. <laughs> but uh, those were added later. And so at first you say, well, that's very interesting. There's some stars there, right? And uh, that's kind of what we might expect. Maybe we expected a few more in the center. Um, but uh, maybe there's one little one there. It's a far more interesting story than that. What could we learn besides just by looking at those stars there? Well, astronomers quickly realized that this would be a place where gravity would be very, very crucial to our understanding. So they wanted to go in and watch the motions of these stars. How were they moving? Could their motions betray something more significant? And sure enough, they did. So one team in particular at UCLA pioneered a method to go in with the best possible uh, telescopes and techniques to clearly watch the very center over a period of about 10 years watch the stars move, then they'd be able to use, again, the laws of gravity and motion to, to figure out what's really going on there. Here's what they saw. And you can see they've color-coded several stars, their motion year after year. Every individual dot reveals a particular year. And so you can see the dashed lines indicating some orbits. These stars are orbiting something, but it's invisible. Now, surely we can agree that to orbit something, it has to have some powerful gravity. Earth orbits the sun because of its gravity. Well, these are massive stars orbiting something, and frankly, they were orbiting at extremely fast velocities. That would tell us the gravity is extremely powerful. Well, I think you know where I'm going here, as you can see. If something's invisible, but it has extremely powerful gravity, what would be a very good explanation for that? Yeah, a supermassive black hole. And the motions of the stars essentially would tell us the mass of the black hole. So I'm going to go ahead and try to play a short video clip showing you the motions of the stars. And you can watch a number of them as they zip around. They put a little fake star there so we can kind of see where they're going around. But I think you see the idea. There's one in particular there. I'm going to try to rewind this if I can. Oops. Coming in from the upper left, zips around it, the yellow star in the yellow orbit there zips around it. And you're watching the years count by there in the upper right. And so again, you see the point that really these stars are orbiting very quickly around something extremely massive. And this is evidence for a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. How massive? You see the number there? Four million times the mass of our sun, four million times. So um, while I don't have time to get into black holes, I will in my next lecture. If you want to come back for the next lecture, I'll cover black holes in more detail. But what an astonishing discovery here a few years ago. Number one, using infrared wavelengths. Number two, using the best telescopes we have. But number three, this very clever, ingenious technique to monitor the motions of the stars orbiting around this object essentially told us what was happening there. And I'll just take one moment to mention that over intervening years, we have found that almost every other galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. So we're not unusual in that respect, but clearly it tells us something very fundamental about galaxies, doesn't it? And there's so much more to be learned. Now we have to use other techniques to detect them in other galaxies, but what an astonishing find to be able to say, wow, this is a common threat. What does that mean about the galaxy's formation, how it's changed over time? What does it mean today? So again, another whole branch that we might go off and study there. So quite a story. Well, you might know that black holes uh, love to suck things in. Fortunately for us, our black hole is not sucking very much in. Why? Because when they do, before the matter actually is pulled into the black hole, it is superheated. And so before it is devoured, so to speak, it's going to give off a lot of energy. In fact, if we look back 
into the early universe at other galaxies, we often see them where their black hole is literally doing this. The black hole itself is not giving off energy, but the matter it's pulling in is. We have seen some very small examples of that within our galaxy where the black hole in our galaxy has had a little snack, so to speak. Maybe pulls in something maybe the size of a planet and gives off a little burst of energy. So we're in no danger, but the point is very interesting because of the power involved here. When this occurs, x-rays are emitted. So clearly we wouldn't want to be anywhere near that, would we? And we're not. Again, you will recall we're about 28,000 light years out from the center. But here's an example of that occurring that further supports our understanding that this is a supermassive black hole. It fits the model very, very well when we see these x-ray bursts from the center of the galaxy. Well, besides all of that, the Milky Way has been known to do some terrible things in its time. It has literally disrupted other galaxies. And frankly, it's still in the process. Here you see a couple images. I'm going to show you a couple of animations here as well showing the Milky Way there in blue. And you see a large extended kind of orange streak of light. We're just trying to illustrate the stars of another galaxy being greatly disrupted. This is the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And it was um, unfortunate enough to get too close to the Milky Way. And the Milky Way's powerful gravity now is able to literally shred this thing and rip it apart and spray stars all over. So we actually think this is not uncommon. We've seen it in many other galaxies occurring. And we think, frankly, it played a significant role in the, again, formation of galaxies. Even over long periods of time, galaxies change, they evolve, and this is a fundamental part of that that galaxies interact. Sometimes they'll kind of pass by each other, be somewhat of a modest interaction. Other times they could actually collide and really disrupt each other. So what we're seeing here essentially is the fact that the Milky Way is the dominant object here. I'll show you this little clip. And its gravity is going to shred this smaller one into this stream. I've had the opportunity to speak with several astronomers, one out here at Fermilab right near us, that study this. And it's a fascinating field to be able to use the motions of those stars. We don't see them moving this quickly, of course, but to be able to understand how the Milky Way can greatly disrupt other galaxies. Okay, so that's one example. Over here I'm going to show you a little bit more of a model showing what would have happened as the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy got near the Milky Way. Now they've highlighted the the brightness so you can see it more clearly, but notice how it's greatly stretched out and disrupted. Those stars are orbiting around the Milky Way and it is shredding them apart. So that galaxy has really been uh, broken apart. Quite a dramatic uh, view. Let me maybe run that one again. So again, over its history, the Milky Way has done this numerous times. There's evidence within the Milky Way of different groups of stars that we see that seem to be the remnants of ancient galaxies that the Milky Way has shredded. So it's by no means a static structure, is it? Its galaxy is very, its structure is very dynamic, very powerful gravity, and it just makes it that much more interesting to study for us to understand some of these uh, processes that have taken place over millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. Some of you may have even heard that we have pretty good indication that in the distant future, the Milky Way galaxy and that beautiful Andromeda galaxy are approaching. And they will likely interact. And that will not be a big one and a small one. That will be two large galaxies, and that will be quite a dramatic encounter. But don't worry, we've got a few billion years to go, so <laughs> nothing to worry about just yet. So again, we see uh, part of the Milky Way's personality here, so to speak, as it's uh, done some damage to other galaxies. And again, another interesting story there is galaxies over long periods would change. They might absorb other galaxies. As I said, we've seen remnants of that uh, within the Milky Way. Well, as we moved into the later part of the 20th century, another major discovery was made here by a young woman named Vera Rubin. I had the pleasure of meeting her once. And Vera Rubin began to measure motions uh, of the Milky Way star. She found something very surprising. This was in the late 1970s, and at first, Took a little bit of time for most astronomers to kind of warm up to her idea. She carefully measured the rotation of the Milky Way and found that the outer regions 
we're rotating much faster than we expected. Now you think, well, what does that mean? Why would they not rotate fast? Think of the planets in our solar system. You probably know, of course, that the closer the planet is to the sun, the faster it orbits. You think of Mercury or Venus, but the farther the planet, the slower it orbits, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Something roughly similar should happen with most galaxies. The stars closer to the center should orbit faster. The ones farther away should orbit slower. But what Vera Rubin found was the stars quite a distance out were still orbiting fast. So what did that tell her? Well, what it told her was that all of the matter, all of the mass in the Milky Way was not concentrated in the center like it is in our solar system with the sun. That's why the planets orbit the way they do, because most of the matter is concentrated in the sun. If the Milky Way had most of its matter concentrated in the center, we should see that, but that's not what she saw. The rotation that she measured indicated there had to be far more matter than we could see. Now let me emphasize that I don't mean just going and using a different wavelength of light. We couldn't see it in any form of light. And so the term has become now dark matter. It doesn't give off any type of light. How do we even know it's there? We know it's there because its gravity betrays it. The motion of stars we can see is greatly affected by this dark matter. To this day, we still don't know exactly what this stuff is, but we have been making good progress on narrowing it down and narrowing it down. Right now, there's a number of experiments going on to try to understand what this is. But this was a profound discovery because as you see here, it's kind of hard to draw dark matter. But in our diagram, what we used to see as the Milky Way was really only essentially the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It was only a small part of what's really there. Picture now a much, much larger halo of this dark matter. Trillions and trillions and trillions of these particles, we think, all with a tiny bit of gravity that adds up and has a tremendous effect on the Milky Way. Frankly, it has so much effect that there's approximately five to ten times as much of this stuff as there is of the visible matter that you and I are used to seeing. So earlier, when I told you there was approximately 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, that's probably not too far off, but the actual mass of the Milky Way is probably closer to five times that, close to one trillion solar masses if you include the dark matter. So a very different galaxy than maybe we thought of 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we are now trying to, again, understand what this is. How else can we study? It's very difficult to study. You can imagine. It doesn't really interact very easily. So much more to learn there. And I'll just finish that section by saying, of course, if that's the dominant gravity in the galaxy, would that not have been the dominant force perhaps in number one, forming the galaxy, and number two, how the galaxy again has changed and evolved over time as it's absorbed others. Picture now other galaxies with dark matter. So we see a very different universe than maybe we thought of 30, 40, 50 years ago with this dark matter. Well, I want to finish up briefly by just discussing other galaxies just a bit more, and then we're going to take one final journey outward. Um, here you see a diagram originally done by Edwin Hubble back oh, almost 100 years ago now. And it just basically summarizes the different types of galaxies. Let's start down here towards the center with these ones marked E0 and E5. These are what we call elliptical galaxies. These are very different from our Milky Way. Essentially think of them as having that central bulge region but also that outer halo but no disk. So it's a galaxy with no disk, and that would imply, well, no disk. We don't envision any younger star formation going on, and we don't envision a lot of gas and dust to make younger stars, do we? So these are, again, older stars in these galaxies. They can change somewhat. As you see, they vary by their shape, E0 indicating almost perfectly spherical. E2, 3, 4, 5 would indicate they're somewhat flattened. Okay. As we move to the right a bit, we get into what we call the S0 galaxies. Now, these galaxies might look like an elliptical, but they begin to show some indication of a flat disk. They do not have spiral arms. They do not really have much gas and dust to form new stars, but they begin to kind of show us a transition 
into the spiral galaxies, as you see on the right. Here we have to branch off into two main branches. On the top, we have the SA, the SB, and the SC. SA indicates a large central bulge region and a fairly smooth disk where we don't really see very distinct, clear, sharp spiral arms. In contrast, look at SC, that's exactly what we do see. We see a much smaller central region. We see very clear, distinct, more open spiral arms. They're not wound very tightly around the center. We also have below, essentially counterparts here, the barred spiral versions, as you see. We talked about this a little bit earlier. S barred A, B, and C. So this was a very simple, convenient way for Hubble to classify galaxies. We still use this to this day. Finally, way over on the left here, we have some that don't really fit so well in the diagram because frankly they're just called irregular galaxies. Why? They don't really have a regular shape. They look like giant blobs out in space. But notice, again it's kind of subtle, but notice the blue color there. And we mentioned this earlier. That indicates, in general, slightly hotter stars, slightly more massive stars, generally speaking, younger stars. So here star formation is generally occurring in contrast with the elliptical galaxies. So this gives us a nice big picture, an overview of galaxies and helps us see the Milky Way a little bit more in context. We start to see its other types of galaxies that we might compare it to and again learn a little bit more about all of them in general. So let's take a look at the Milky Way's neighbors. You see the Milky Way there on the right in our diagram. You see the Andromeda galaxy we mentioned, a bit larger we think. In the lower left we have one other good sized spiral called the Triangulum Galaxy. And then we have a number of other smaller galaxies that you can see that are generally either the irregular shape in the lower right, or above that we have what we call dwarf elliptical galaxies, kind of miniature systems so to speak. And these tend to kind of be satellite galaxies or galaxies that are orbiting around the larger ones. So for example, the Milky Way has these two at the lower right, SMC and LMC indicate the small Magellanic Cloud and large Magellanic Clouds. These are orbiting around the Milky Way. Its gravity is pretty much controlling them. The Andromeda Galaxy has several galaxies orbiting it. As you can see up there, M110, NGC 147, and 185. So the point being that, again, our local group of galaxies here has a variety. Three large spirals, some irregulars, some dwarf ellipticals. And these galaxies of our local group are close enough together that their gravity does have effect on each other. They're not so much distorting each other greatly right now, but they are somewhat bound in a small group here. Okay? In contrast, you may have heard Really, the entire universe is expanding. Galaxies are all moving apart from each other. That's true. But here on a very small scale, these are close enough together, they can somewhat kind of fight against that or overcome that and hold together. So they're not really moving away from us just here locally. So again, this gives us a nice view of some of the Milky Way's, you know, partner galaxies in the local group. These, of course, are close enough for us to study in some detail, other galaxies uh, being farther away. But I want to finish up with a, a bit of an imagination journey for you to kind of give you a little bit of a scale of some of this. We spent most of our evening with the Milky Way, but let's, let's go back and dive back in here to a region near the sun. We see some of the nearby stars. Maybe you've heard a few of these. Maybe you're even familiar to look up in the night sky and see a few of them. You see some there like uh, Arcturus or Sirius. Procyon, a few others. This is kind of the sun's immediate neighborhood, some of the nearby stars in our galaxy. This diagram probably goes out, oh, approximately 100 light years, something like that. So we're, we're pretty well zoomed in here, and we're just kind of getting a view of the local environment of the sun. But here's where we're going to step back. Again, take you on just a bit of a journey. That local environment is a very small part of the Milky Way galaxy. Remember, 100,000 light years in diameter. So even 1,000 light years would only be 1% of that, wouldn't it? So it really does give you some sense of the scale of the Milky Way.
a year or so back, I was down at Adler Planetarium and got to see a particular show, and they really did a good job, I think, of impressing that. You think, oh, you know, there's a lot of stars out there, but they kind of took us on a journey, and we're going through the stars, and we're going through the stars, and we're going through the stars, and it was like going through a snowstorm. And they just let it run for minute after minute after minute after minute. And you really got a sense of what millions of stars mean. So here we are in our home galaxy, but as I said, I want to finish up by backing us out. Let's step back and see our local group. You see us there towards the center, over towards the lower right, the Andromeda galaxy with its companion galaxies. Down at the bottom is um, the Triangulum galaxy. And again, you see some other nearby ones there in our local region, out to maybe 10 to 20 million light years, something like that. So quite a scale there, but uh, here's where it gets interesting, I think. Let's step back now by a factor of 10 and place our local group right in the center. Okay, so here's where we were just a few minutes ago. Notice the enormous congregations and groups of galaxies here, this particular group, this one and this one. Galaxies cluster together in far larger numbers than is our local group. And of course, your attention is immediately drawn over here, not only to the Canis group and Ursa Major group, but the Virgo cluster, approximately 50 million light years away, thousands of galaxies, thousands of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. So it's really quite mind-boggling, isn't it, to, to really consider this structure, to think about the scales, to think about the amount of matter, the gravity, don't forget that dark matter, and to see how our universe looks. It's not perfectly uniformly spread out in galaxies, is it? They clump together. And uh, this, again, would lead us off into another whole discussion of, well, why do they do that, how do they do that, those types of things. But our universe is somewhat clumpy, as we like to say. Galaxies gather together in groups, as you see here. Imagine, again, the gravity holding these groups together. In fact, there's so much gravity there in the Virgo cluster that our entire local group is being drawn towards it. Imagine that feeling of being drawn towards it. Okay? But again, you see some of these other clusters of galaxies, again, of billions of stars each. Well, I have one more step for you. So hold on, here we go. Now look at the center there in the red is that Virgo supercluster. We see other superclusters. Centaurus, Shapely, all the different ones there. Now we're out to hundreds of millions of light years. This diagram approximately one billion light years across, and yet that is only a relatively small part of our universe. So it does make you feel small. It does humble you to step back and see these structures, see how our universe is put together, see these literally millions of galaxies, each with billions of stars. There's plenty to study. There's plenty to study. Astronomers are hard at work, of course, putting together this magnificent picture of our vast universe. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. It's been a pleasure having you, so thank you for being with us tonight. I'd like to invite you back uh, Saturday, November 10th. I will discuss black holes in more detail. So love to have you come back for that. And just before we take some questions, I just want to remind you that if uh, you'd like to, you can visit me out on YouTube. I've got a series of lectures out there on the solar system that I think you'd enjoy. It gives you a nice, brief course you can watch at your convenience. And another series on stars and galaxies. You can see the URLs there, or you can just search for my name out on YouTube. <laughs> And again, get a nice overview of some of the science in those particular uh, fields of astronomy. So it would be my pleasure to take any questions that you might have saved up. Okay, let's start here and I'll try to repeat the questions as we go along. So spiral arms, big question. Spiral arms are not solid objects. We might look at that and think of a, maybe a child's little pinwheel spinning around. It's not how they work. Spiral arms think of as an increased density of stars. There's more gravity there. And this is where the gas and dust concentrates, and this is where new stars form. Now remember, those new stars, when they form, we're going to get all different masses. Some are going to last a long time, others are not. 
the most massive stars forms are going to be very bright, they're going to light up that spiral arm, and they're going to die quickly, and by that we mean within a few tens of millions of years. They will then generate the next generation of stars, and so in that spiral arm is where all of that activity is. Stars may even drift in and out of that spiral arm, but for the most part that's where the, the, the gas, the matter is to form new stars and keep the spiral arm kind of going over longer periods of time. So it's a very um, complex situation for astronomers to analyze and understand, but we've got, I think, the basics down. Yeah, so this, the question has to do with black holes, and you use this term spaghettification, popularized by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the short answer is, as matter falls in, yes, it gets greatly stretched out by the black hole's gravity. It's almost like a long piece of spaghetti getting pulled in. It happens before it falls in the black hole. Okay, other questions, sir? Good question. So what's stopping that central black hole from really pulling in a lot of the Milky Way and growing and growing? It can uh, reach out to a small distance with its gravity and pull matter in that gets too close, but gravity uh, falls off in strength dramatically with distance. So in other words, once you get out to, I don't know the exact number, but several hundred, several thousand light years, the black hole's gravity now becomes essentially weak that it cannot reach out that far. Again, anything coming close enough surely is in danger and will get pulled in. So that immediate area is pretty well swept clear. The other point to that would be if matter like you saw those stars are moving fast enough, they're able to kind of zip around it without getting pulled in. So the lesson is don't go too slow. Yeah, yeah so the comment was... Uh, 1933, I think sounds about right, they uh, had a World's Fair and they took the light from a star and used it to turn on World's Fair and that light had been traveling since the last World's Fair, since it left that star. So it was a nice example of how long it took the light from that star to get here and for us to be able to see it. Other questions? I thought I saw a couple. Good question. Was or is the sun part of an open cluster? Uh, yes and no. So yes, in fact, interesting research recently I've been uh, looking at, we're getting a little, it's very difficult to trace back the sun's, you know, motion back four billion years, but we've got some progress there to say, yeah, we almost certainly formed in a star cluster, but over four billion years the stars will often drift out of that. So we've identified a few stars that might be likely, kind of, what do you want to call it, Partners. you know, Partners. Partners, yeah, from that, that star cluster, but Still kind of early, it's very uh, intense uh, research. We've gotten some new data down from a European satellite to help us with that. Uh, the sun by now, though, has drifted out of an open cluster. Yeah, we're not part of one. Yeah, so the galactic halo, and the question was, it is essentially stars. Um, being such a large volume of space, the distance between stars tends to be much greater. That's what I meant by the lower density of stars, meaning, well, in a certain volume of space, you have fewer stars. They tend to be very far apart. So we don't see a lot of light from it. It's very difficult to study because the light is very, very dim in general. Good question. How old is the Milky Way? Are galaxies still forming? We think that galaxies actually started forming fairly quickly after the beginning of the universe, and by that we mean within several hundred million years. How do we know that? Well, we have to somehow look at the very early universe, and you might be familiar with the fact that, again, as we look to greater and greater distances, we're looking farther and farther back in time. And we can see pretty far back into time now, two several hundred million years after the beginning, and that's where we see galaxies starting to form. We've not yet kind of gotten beyond that, but we think we're getting close. So we think most galaxies started back then as smaller objects, and there's kind of two components to this. Number one, you know, these, these objects would again contract down and form stars and the various structures, but don't forget, there would have been often these mergers these collisions, especially early in the universe, the entire universe was smaller. It was a smaller volume of space. Galaxies were closer together on average. Collisions were more likely, and so were mergers. And so galaxies would grow, as I said, by kind of merging with each other. We have seen great evidence of that. Second part of the question, are galaxies still forming today? No new galaxies are forming today, but galaxies continue to change and evolve as they merge, as stars change, as dark matter has various effects. So no, we don't really think there's any new galaxies, but they continue to, to change uh, in various ways. Okay, so I think the question was our, our sun, our solar system is between the spiral arms. We had a 
a diagram early, and that appears to be correct. We, we, we seem to be between the two major spiral arms. Now, we think the suns, of course, have been around a long time. We may well have drifted in and out of those spiral arms. Um, has it had a big effect on us? That's possible. We could have drifted it through regions with more dust or less dust. We could have drifted near other stars or farther from other stars. So there's a lot of possibilities there. We haven't nailed down a lot of the, those details, but surely in the, life's, uh, the sun's four and a half billion year lifespan, we've probably drifted in and out more than a few times. Yeah, okay. So I think the question was, is, the, the dark, matter is dark matter affected by a black hole the same as normal matter? Yeah. And um, I can't give you a specific definitive answer because we still don't know exactly what dark matter is, but it certainly would make sense. It is some type of matter, and it is affected by gravity, and clearly that's a dominant characteristic of black holes. So that's in very, very likely, I would say. Um, I haven't seen any specific research on that, but that would seem very likely. Was there a second part to that? And then, in fact, the, the follow-up part of that was regular matter falls in the black hole, heats up and grows and can seal. Dark matter, dark matter. Yeah, good question. Uh, I mentioned that as regular matter falls into a black hole, it's heated up, gives off some light. Would dark matter do that? Again, think of dark matter as not giving off any type of light, regardless of its temperature. I think scientists are doing a great job of trying to step back and really kind of get their arms around all the possibilities. At first we thought, oh, well, you know, there must be this particle. And then at some point people said, is there just only one particle? Could there be many types of dark matter particles? Very possibly, we don't know that. But the dominant property, again, is it doesn't give off light that we can, we can study. So, you know, that makes it difficult to study, obviously, and we'd have to wait and see on that. Yeah, so do the stars orbiting the central black hole approach the speed of light? No, but they're approaching a significant velocity, millions of miles per hour. In fact, you might hear something in the next, oh, six to 12 months because we are now watching carefully as one of the stars is making its closest approach. And that's interesting by itself, but frankly, uh, those of you that are a little bit more familiar with that, it's also gonna be an extremely excellent, fascinating, interesting test of general relativity to watch to see what happens there. So we're watching closely. Stay tuned for some uh, update on that as this star comes zipping around in the next oh, 06 to 12 months. Should be very, very interesting. Okay, so the question had to do with the, ver the great variety of galaxies. What's causing that? It's like a lot of things. There's multiple factors. There's no one simple answer. Why do we have an elliptical? Why do we have a spiral? Why do we have an irregular? You could start out with um, factors during formation. If a galaxy starts out as a large cloud, which we think most did, with very little motion, the particles and even the early stars that form will tend to fall more or less towards the center and you will somewhat end up with more of an elliptical galaxy. Those stars will kind of orbit the center. The galaxy as a whole will not spin very much. But imagine the opposite now. If you have an early protogalactic cloud that has some overall spin to it, the laws of angular momentum are going to dictate that that cloud is going to flatten as it contracts, and you're going to get a disk. So that's one example of some of the factors that can, well, generate spiral structure. Now, I can tell you also I spent almost two years reading a very uh, uh, advanced book on galaxies, and there's tremendous complexity, there's tremendous number of factors, there's not universal agreement on a lot of these things because they're so large and they're so complex, but that would be, I think, one good example of, uh, of saying, well, that could have been a factor. How many collisions did a galaxy have? Does this galaxy have more or less dark matter than this galaxy? You know, that, that's a possibility as well. So there's numerous factors. Way back uh, early 20th century, maybe what you heard the, the remnants of was we, we kind of went down a path of saying, well, do ellipticals change into spirals or spirals into ellipticals? You still once in a while hear the word early type galaxy or a late type galaxy. We've pretty much discarded that. Galaxies do change, but it's not a clear, oh, elliptical change into spiral. That's not no longer supported by our, our, our latest evidence. So um, I would just summarize by saying there's numerous factors that have to do with galaxy structure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so the question is how earlier astronomers, 18th century, 19th century, how could they measure a light year?
I would use the word conceptually. They understood the concept that once we measured the speed of light, which was done prior to that, you immediately begin to think in terms of the amount of time as a distance. Say, well, in this time, it would travel this far. So, yeah, we go back uh, prior to 1700, we had a pretty good idea of the speed of light. So conceptually, you had that. Could we measure it? No. But you could essentially discuss it with your colleagues. Say, well, if a star was this far away, it would take light this long to get there. Um, what might shed a little further light on this is the idea of sooner or later we had to find the distances to the stars in an independent way. And that was done about 1840. We first used simple trigonometry. We looked at nearby stars from one side of Earth's orbit in January, and we looked at them from another position in June. We saw a very tiny shift because of our changed position, and we could draw a gigantic triangle essentially in space and say that star has to be this far away. The earliest stars were found to be 10, 15, 20 light years away. So that was the first measurements. Maybe that would, okay, so how did we find the speed of light? That's another story. We can do that um, here on Earth, of course, we, but prior to technology, I'm always proud to say astronomers did this first. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this. So picture, bear with me here a second. Let's put the sun in the middle. Let's put the Earth going around the sun here. Okay, and out here we're going to have Jupiter. And Jupiter, a lot of you know, has got four moons to it, right? So we start watching these moons and we start figuring out that, well, these moons take so long to go around Jupiter. Maybe the inner moon takes two days, the next moon takes four days, and the next one takes eight days. And Okay, so we get that pretty well established. And so we're sitting here on Earth watching this and we can look on our telescopes and time those moons. But something interesting happened. We would say, well, that moon goes around every two days. Let's measure it here in January. Let's just say, take a vacation. We come back six months later. The Earth is over here, is it not? July. We go to look at that moon and we say, well, it is going around every two days, but its timing is off. Instead of going around every night, every other midnight, let's just say, every other midnight I see the moon do the, you know, it's like off by some amount, 10 minutes or something. Why would that be? That would be because when we measured the moon here, the light had a certain distance to travel. Okay, let's just call that 5 AU. I'm just gonna pick a round number here. Actually, Jupiter's about, I should make that a four is what I should make that, okay. 4 AU, the light took a certain amount of time to reach us. What happened when we measured it here the light had to travel one additional AU. So astronomers said, well, I'm going to pick a round number. Let's say that the, the, the motion of the moon was such that it was at 1,000 seconds late. Should have crossed right at midnight, but it was 1,000 seconds late or whatever that is, 10 minutes or something. So the point is, it took the light 1,000 seconds to travel that distance in addition to that distance. Do you see that, the time delay there? So you'd say, well, it took the light 1,000 minutes to travel this distance. Actually, I did it again, and this is actually two, isn't it? You guys got to keep me honest. You divide that out and you say, oh, that's three times 10 to the eighth kilometers divided by 1,000 seconds. Let's see if I can do it here. And I'm not writing very nicely, I know, but what do you get? Boy, I'm really not doing good today, am I? 10 to the fifth kilometers per second. So that's how we knew the speed of light. I think it was the year 1686 or something. That was our first reasonably good measure of the speed of light. And when, when, when did we first be able to do that? I believe, I might be incorrect here, but I believe it was 1686. A guy named Hans Romer or something. Yeah. So I'm happy to say the astronomers did it first. Okay. Later on, physicists found other ways. But the, do you see how we did that? Essentially, I could slow down and do it a little more clearly, perhaps. That was fast. But by measuring a known quantity out there of time and saying, well, wait a minute, the time has changed. It took the light longer to travel that distance. We knew the distance. We knew the time it took. You divide it out. So good question. Other questions? You guys are...
asking some good ones. Okay. When does the food come in? So I hope you enjoyed your little Milky Ways. But it was a pleasure having you tonight. Very good.